famine. Let's kneel and pray this morning. Father, what a privilege and blessing it is to be this place in your house today. Father, we look around us and we see how people need you. And God, as Billy Graham has once said, you've not called the angels to be evangelists, but God, you've called your children to take your word of hope and your word of life to the ends of the earth. Father, many in this room, if we were truthful about where we are in that, many of us struggle to take it even next door. Father, you've given us the Holy Spirit if we have Christ, and he is our boldness. But may we recognize today that people need Jesus. And Father, if we truly love them, if we truly care, we will want those opportunities. Lord, give us that heart and that spirit today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take your copy of God's Word and let's go to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Many years ago, Bill Hybels, a very well-known pastor of Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago, for many years it was the largest evangelical church in America, wrote a book entitled Becoming a Contagious Christian. In the book, he shared a letter that a woman who became a Christian actually wrote to a person who was a believer in Jesus Christ and shared with him her story. And it went like this. You know, when we met, I began to discover a new vulnerability, a warmth and a lack of pretense about you that impressed me. I saw in you a thriving spirit, no signs of internal stagnation anywhere. I could tell you were a growing person, and I liked that. I saw you had strong self-esteem, not based on the fluff of self-help books, but on something a lot deeper. I saw that you lived by convictions and priorities and not just by convenience, selfish pleasure, and financial gain. I've never met anyone like that before. I felt a depth of love and concern as you listened to me and didn't judge me. You tried to understand me. You sympathized and you celebrated with me. You demonstrated kindness and generosity and not just to me, but to other people as well. And you stood for something. You were willing to go against the grain of society and follow what you believed to be true, no matter what people said and no matter how much it cost you. And for those reasons and a whole host of others, I found myself really wanting what you had. Now that I've become a Christian, I wanted to write to tell you I'm grateful beyond words for how you lived out your Christian life in front of me. If I was to ask you this morning, how many of you all have ever received a thank you note for a gift? Many of you may, have, may raise your hand. If I was to ask you, how many of you have actually written a thank you note for a gift or for something? Ladies, most of you would probably raise your hand. Guys, you would say, well, my wife or my mom did it for me. And I had to sign my name. Amen? But how many of you have ever received a thank you note for taking someone to Jesus? You see, that's the only thank you note that really matters. And we get upset and we don't get thank you notes maybe about something else. I've, I've, had, I've heard ladies say, well, I can't believe I gave such and such a gift and they never sent me a thank you note. Can you believe that? Guys don't really care. So that's the only reason I use the ladies there. But have you ever received a thank you note for that? You see, the Bible's very clear when it comes to living out our faith to others. But a life lived for Jesus without a verbal testimony to coincide with that just doesn't mean a whole lot. It just means, man, I tried to be a good person. I tried to do good things. And that's why the Bible says that faith comes through hearing the Word of Christ. This morning we have an awesome opportunity to participate with God in the setting out of four men, the gospel ministry of being a deacon. 
Friendship Baptist Church is very special in how we utilize deacons because the deacon's body at Friendship Baptist Church is not a hierarchical body. It's not a place of stature. It's not a place where you would say, well, I've got a problem. I'm taking it to the deacon, and the deacon will set the pastor straight. Some of you may have been part of a church like that, but the deacon body in the Bible, in the New Testament, has one sole purpose, to serve. It's to partner with the pastor, with the leadership team that the church has already called, to handle and deal with specific needs and ministries within the present context of the body. Would you stand as we read God's Word and what He says about deacons? Now at this time, meaning that the church had been going for a while, while the, numbers, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, in the next chapter, Stephen becomes the first martyr for the faith of Jesus Christ. And Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, literally a Gentile or a Greek. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. May God honor and bless you and give his word. You may be seated. There are two things I want to discuss this morning. One, the reason for deacons, and second, the biblical qualifications for being a deacon. But first, the reason for deacons. There are at least three reasons that Paul gives here in this, or that Luke gives, should I say, in Acts, as to what is the, the reason for the de- reason that deacons were called. The first is the reason of church growth. The church began to grow. It began to expand beyond its borders. And so the church, by default, needed more people to serve. They needed guys that they could put in leadership positions, people who were trustworthy, people who knew the Word of God, not just intellectually, but knew the Word of God spiritually and in their hearts. Second, there were ministries to the less fortunate and neglected that were needed. They ministered to those who were neglected. Now, I want you to notice what Luke says and how he says it. He says that these Greek-speaking Jews, they believed they were being neglected. What does that mean? These Greek-speaking Jews were people who were from the, di- the diaspora. All right. Now, the diaspora is simply a fancy word, meaning that in the years past, there have been nations that conquered Israel, Judea, and also Samaria. And they would take these people to their nations, and there they would expect them to live, to grow, mature, have a family, what have you. Well, anyway, towards the end of some of their lives, the widows would often come back to Jerusalem, some of the men too, but they would come back to Jerusalem in hopes of dying in the land of their forefathers. You may have known someone who said, well, I'm originally from Tennessee, or I'm originally from Oklahoma, or from Alabama. And, you know, I may be living in Mississippi now, but I want to be buried in this state where I was from. Or and it may be the vice versa. You may be living in Oklahoma or Alabama and say, I want to go back to Mississippi where I was born. I want to be buried there. This was kind of the heart for these Gentile speaking or these Greek speaking individuals. Now here's a couple of things. One, when they came back, Jerusalem had really changed. Very few people knew these individuals at all. In fact, truth be told, no one knew who they were. And so when these individuals were saved and became not simply Jews, but they became part of the body of Christ, and they were Christians, they would come into the church, but no one in the church knew who they were. They couldn't say, well, yeah, I remember your granddaddy from way back when, or, you know, yeah, I know your mom and dad. I know these people who know you. They didn't know anybody. Church family, let me ask you, have you ever said before, 
Well, I didn't know such and such who was in church today. Did you know those people who are sitting over there? I've never seen them before. I've had people, friendships say, Brother Brian, I don't know these people who joined the church. And guys, I want you to know something. We can never become the kind of body that only cares for a certain group of people. We've always got a body that reaches, have to be a body that reaches out and cares for every single person who is not only a member of Friendship Baptist Church, but also a person to whom we minister to. Yes, it's part cultural that we tend to be drawn to those people that we know, those people that we can identify with. But you see, there are too many people who are lost in the cracks. People who are crying out and pleading for a church family and a church home. And the apostles, the pastors, they simply said, we can't do it all. I want you to hear your pastor say, I cannot do it all by myself. If you expect me to, then it's better that Friendship Baptist Church be a member of, of about, be a group of about 50 people because I'll be able to know you. I'll be able to know more or less your extended family. Some pastors have a great memory. I happen to not be one of those guys. But I love you. Church family, I want the best for you. Just as the apostles wanted the best for the church in the New Testament. And it is essential that we have men who serve and they're able to take up where I lack or where I am not able to serve. There's a third area and a third reason why deacons were called and why they are called today. And that is to aid pastors. Gives the pastors freedom. The apostles themselves say in verse 2, said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Listen, I've known pastors who do it all. The bivocational pastors are kind of my heroes of the faith, if you will. Because the bivocational pastors, these guys who work a 40-hour week doing regular work, and then the church expects them to do exactly what a full-time vocational pastor does as well. And they only pay them a fraction of that cost. And they say, well, you know what? I can't believe you didn't make it to so-and-so's funeral. I can't believe you didn't do this. I can't believe you didn't do it that. Here's the deal. The more time that a pastor spends outside of the Word of God, the weaker the messages will become and the weaker that his pastoral ministry will be. It is essential. It is essential, guys, that I spend time in the Word of God. If you ever feel, you know what, Brother Brian? You've not been in the Word this week. You better come call me on that immediately. I love preaching, but I also love being a pastor. And when you're in the hospital, I hope you've learned my heart by now. My heart's to be with you. I may not always be able to be there with every single person. But that's one of the reasons that we have a deacon body. And if we know, that's the thing, if we know, by the way, if you're in the hospital, if you're sick, please contact the church office and let us know. If you don't contact us and you say, well, Brother Brian, it was on Facebook or I told such and such. I may never know that. But please call the church family and the church office. We would love to be a great ministry and a great asset to you. Those are some of the three reasons for deacons. Second, qualifications for being a deacon. There are four qualifications. First, a deacon is called by God. And he's simply affirmed by men. He's called by God. Before any of these men were ever presented to you, there was about a six-month period of time where the deacon body prayed over the names of men at Friendship Baptist Church. In fact, there were several men the church was, the deacons were struggling with that said, how about this man, how about this man? And <clears throat> guys, we met several times on various individuals. And God finalized the men that you see before you today. But a deacon is called by God. It's not something we call ourselves to. It's not something that we inherit or that is given to us or should be expected. But being called as a deacon is simply a calling by God upon your life to serve Him and to serve faithfully. 
And while I'm saying that, what you're doing in your life today, you may not think there's much to that, but I want you to know that God has called you to do and to serve where you're serving him outside these church walls. God has called you to it. And I would pray for you exactly what Paul says. Whatever God has called you to do, do it with all of your heart. Do it with everything you have. Second qualification of being a deacon, he is to be a man of good reputation. 1 Timothy 3 says a deacon is to be faithful to his wife. He is to be faithful to his family. He is to be someone that people look at and they see an individual who is different. He doesn't live nor seek to live a worldly life. But he seeks to live a life that is faithful to God. Third, a deacon is filled with the Spirit or full of the Spirit, as Luke would say in chapter 6. That means he's growing in his personal faith. He's not satisfied with where he is in Christ. He wants to grow. It's obvious. You don't have to ask him to serve. He's asking you, hey, where can I serve? A deacon wants to serve. You can also tell the Spirit of God is working through them. Fourth, a deacon should be a man of wisdom. He seeks things of God and has no agenda but God's agenda alone. I want you to notice something that you may not have ever thought of before. And deacons, I want you especially to listen to this. You don't hear anything else from the deacon body after Acts chapter 6. You hear from two men, Stephen in chapter 7 and Philip in chapter 8. And you know why you don't see see or hear a whole lot from them? Because they're too busy ministering, witnessing, and dying for Jesus Christ. They're about the work of the Lord. They're not about their own ministries. They're about Jesus. Being a deacon is not a high, but it is a low calling. A calling to serve with a pastor. When I came, I shared with you guys a hierarchical structure, and it looks like this. In every church... You have God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit right here. Jesus is the head. Below God, you have the people of God, the flock, the church body. Below the church body, you have the pastor as the under-shepherd. And alongside the pastor, you have deacons. You see, friend, when you elevate yourself above people, the only person who's there is God. And nobody is to rule Friendship Baptist Church but Jesus Christ alone. At this time, I'm going to ask the four deacons and their wives to accompany them to please come and choose a chair. Men, if you'll just have a seat, and ladies, if you'll be so gracious and stand behind them, to support them. If you're an ordained man and you've ever served as a deacon, it does not have to be at Friendship Baptist Church. It can be in any church. If you've ever been a pastor, you've ever been on the staff, and you've been ordained by men, they've had laid their hands on you and prayed over you. I'm going to ask you this morning, if you would as well, to stand and to make your way to this side. of the auditorium and guys just kind of make a line along the side there and I will probably try and go last but if you would please just come through and pray over each one in these individuals and their wife church family would you pray over each of these men as well as these other men are praying over them Yeah, guys, if we could just go ahead and get a go against the wall there, that would be great. All right, and Miss Sharon, could we have maybe some soft music? 
That'd be great. Thank you. Brother Ken, would you come?
Thank you. At this time, I'm going to turn this over to Chip Graham, our chairman of the deacons. Chip. Guys, if you would, would, y'all, would you all please stand and kind of gather right here in the middle? Ms. Barbara. Ladies, you come right by your husbands. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this microphone, but uh, I just do want to congratulate uh, all of you. Uh, we've told you this individually, uh, but uh, a lot of prayer has gone into this for the last several months. Uh, we're so pleased as a deacon body to, to welcome you into our family. And uh, guys, uh, as Brother Brian has said, this is something that... Uh, no, it's not a it's not a high position of office, but it's one of service. And I pray that each one of you will encourage us as older deacons to be a little more servant oriented than we can that we are sometimes. We all get busy, but uh, I, again, I just thank you for each one of you and, and uh, your willingness to serve here at Friendship Baptist Church. Friendship family, these are four of your new deacons. Robert, where are you? Where's Robert? Robert, Robert married this right over here on the front row as well. These are your five new deacons, their families. Please call upon them to serve you, and they would love to do so. Guys, love y'all. Please have a seat. All right. As we do it, friendship. I'm going to give you time to commit to what God may be calling you to do. Give you an opportunity to respond in service as well. I'd like to show you a very quick story about a composer named Johann Sebastian Bach. J.S. Bach. Bach was born in 1685, but in the first 10 years of his life, both of his parents died. And yet, nevertheless, early in his life, he determined that he was going to write music. But not just any music, music for God's glory. If you look at the works of Johann Sebastian Bach, most of his works are explicitly biblical in nature and in context. The missionary Albert Schweitzer called him the fifth evangelist next to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. At age 17, Bach became the organist at his church and Soon thereafter, was given charge of the entire music ministry. During his ministry there in Weimar, Germany, he wrote a new cantata every month. During one week period of his, during one three-year period of his life, he wrote, conducted, orchestrated, and performed with a choir and orchestra, mind you, a new cantata every week. No one had any idea at that time what legacy that Bach would leave to the world today. Almost 400 years later, his legacy continues to live on. But for those who studied the works and the composings of J.S. Bach, you'll see at the bottom of his original works three letters, S-D-G. Sole Deo Gloria, meaning to the glory of God. Everything in his life, his legacy that he left behind, points to God. Points us to Jesus. Jesus says in Mark 8, 35, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever wants to lose his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Let me ask you this morning, would you allow God to write a great musical piece through your life? Would you allow God to etch his word, etch his heart upon your heart? There were many people in the word of God But you know the Bible says about David 
that David was a man after God's own heart. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and you're not 100% certain that if you died right now, you'd be in heaven with him, would you come this morning and would you give your life, surrender your life to Jesus Christ? Friends, as as Ken sang earlier, people need the Lord. Your family needs the Lord. A person sitting on the pew next to you this morning perhaps needs the Lord. Your neighbors need the Lord. Your co-workers need the Lord. Some of you know that your managers need the Lord. But are they worth praying over? This altar is open to you this morning. I know we have VBS stuff all over the place. But if you'd like to come this morning and pray over someone by name, would you do that? You may need to simply come and talk to God about an issue that's going on in your life. God may be leading you this morning to unite with Friendship Baptist Church in membership. You're going to hear me say three things. I am not a perfect pastor. This is not a perfect church. But we serve a perfect Savior and Lord. That's the heart of friendship, folks. I pray that's your heart as a Christian as well. To serve Jesus Christ. Brother Ken, would you come? As you come, church family, please bow your heads and let's pray together this morning. And I want you to begin to ask God in your heart, God, what do you want me to do this morning? What are you calling me to do? For God is calling everyone here to something today. It may be he's calling you to grow spiritually. It may be he's calling you to a stronger marriage, to be a godly parent. But it also very very well may be that God is calling you to the cross to be saved. Lord Jesus, you know what it is today you're calling people to do. And Father, the people who are sitting here, including myself, God, we only, only we know what that is. But may we give you glory today and sign our name and our initials on the calling to which you're giving to us and say glory be to God alone. Father, people need Christ. Oh, if someone is lost today and they're not sure of their eternal salvation, would they come right now and be saved? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you respond to what God is calling you to do this morning as we stand and as we sing?